Today we're going to have Tom Cotterill and Alex Martinez. And they're going to be speaking to us about accessing the international design job market. Because so I have a little introduction for Alex that I'd like to read to you. Alex has the bold job of driving design at Founders Factory Africa. She is responsible for building, leading, and guiding the design team while coaching and inspiring founders and their teams on design within Founders Factory Africa's portfolio. She also advocates for design thinking across the organization. Alex is with the vibrancy and enthusiasm of a brand new designer with the subtlety and experience and in-depth knowledge of an industry veteran with 20 years of experience in impact in international design agencies, corporates, in our design team, startups. These expand industries as varied as healthcare, energy, financial services, insurance, telecommunications, education, public sector and retail. And she's always learning both education and work brought to Spain, Germany, Italy, Denmark, Ireland, the UK, South Africa, Uganda, and Australia. Before bringing her expertise and passion to, to Founders Factory Africa, Alex led and grew successful design teams at Fjord and Aviva, among others. As a design leader, Alex combines her love for design with her computational art practice, bringing the best of both worlds to inform her creative leadership approach, making pen and paper collaborate with a keypad and screen to create a sum far greater than this whole. Alex Martinez, it is an absolute privilege to have you here speaking to us. Thank you for joining us. You can go ahead and share your screen now. Thank you, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today with you all. I'm Alice Martinez, as Jonathan said. I'm working at Founders Factory Africa. We are a venture development company, and we work with uh, together with uh, our um, corporate partners, uh, Standard Bank and Netcare, uh, and we build and scale startups in Africa through the full continent. And we focus currently in fintech and healthcare. So I'm super uh, happy and it's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, how to access the international market. As I, you might listen, I have a bit of experience working in different countries. So I would love to share my uh, experience with you all, some tips and tricks that could help you to move into other areas. But before starting, why even looking abroad? So we have uh, 54 countries, countless opportunities to thrive. So before uh, looking abroad, um, I believe everyone is like thinking, ah, what if, what if? It could be great that we focus on what we have and try to look into the amazing opportunities we have in South Africa, in Europe, in all the countries around us. So I just want to bring this into the talk, like as a thought, a very first thought, why should you looking outside? So focus today, remote work. Uh, and let's talk another day about moving abroad. We have a world full of possibilities. I have very good news and bad news for you. The good news is you have thousand opportunities. So you have countless opportunities. You can choose a country, a city, an agency, a studio. There are myriad of opportunities. The equation has endless variables. So as I said, the world is at your feet. But this brings also some bad news. The competition is fierce, as you might know. So for every country, every city, every industry, every company, you might have like dozens, dozens, hundreds and thousands of professionals like you looking for the same opportunity. But I want to encourage everyone, don't worry and stress, who dares and put the effort and the work win. So you have a lot of opportunities. The world, we know COVID has changed things, has paused and accelerated things. Pause things like traveling, moving around, like we are working at a, at a different pace, but uh, there are some things accelerated. So digitalization in some areas, or like the need uh, to do 
cashless payments or any many other things uh, has accelerated how we behave as human beings. We are in constant flux, so the industry at the moment, based on my experience, it speaks about product design. So we need to be always looking for what coming is. How can we adapt ourselves and, and, and talk about uh, how can we grow as a professional, as a designer, to, to be aligned with this contact flux and to feel comfortable with it. You can see here just a couple of uh, samples of different UX areas, and I brought also a different um, other um, areas of skill sets. So one thing you might be called US designer in an agency or an incorporate or an, a, in a specific uh, company, you might be doing something similar and be calling other company. So there is always the a conversation around what kind of designers we are uh, and uh, you should reflect among all this spectrum uh, where are you we are looking for unicorns and more like uh, into the generalist depending on the places you uh, might be like a uh, focus more in a specialty um generalist uh, you might see around that the unicorns are uh, very difficult to find but everyone is looking for unicorns now we're days. Looking for job is a job, so do your research. What I want to encourage is that um, it takes a lot of effort and you should take this on a, as a serious tax. Uh, when you are looking for a job, you might um, put the hours there. You need to be structured and strict. So if you say the world is under my feet. Where should I focus? What are the countries that are interesting to me? Um, for me, always the starting point is like the things you like, the things you enjoy. Uh, what are you following online? Who are your favorite designers? What are your agencies or blogs that you are following to start with? So uh, start with your likes and what you would like to do. Think big. Don't don't. Put some structure and some plan uh, into that uh, research and put the hours. So spend hours and hours looking into other work and who else is doing things. So your dreams are not real. Uh, that's something I read a couple of days ago that uh, stuck with me in my head. So we imagine that the experience will be X and you will be saying, oh, I imagine in one year I'm going to be doing this. But things and life came and is in constant flux, as you will see. We might be traveling this year, everyone, and we are uh, at home working remotely, everyone. But it is important that you have like a clear strategy. What's your vision? If you want to work remotely, you need to be clear and define what's uh, your vision and what do you want to re plan ahead, like plan what you want to be in two months, in six months, in two years. Have a, a thinking about that. If you don't know that just yet, it's fine. But you will be better driven and a, a better in a good direction and good energy if you have like a some kind of path defined from the very beginning. You need to know where you are today to understand when you are going to be. Then Important thing, I know we are a UX uh, um, practitioners uh, here, but you need to create your personal brand. So you need to have a strong brand that represents yourself. So you need to be clear what that personal brand is. What that means is you need to understand your positioning. What is your offering? You need to be very focused and uh, easy to understand what you're offering in a sentence or in three paragraphs. It needs to be very clear what you are offering. And I've seen, I'm telling this, that things that might sound obvious to, to, to some of you, but I am saying this based on hundreds of uh, CVs and portfolios I've been reviewing through the years. You need to be clear of what you do. If you are proposing a project in a portfolio, what was your specific uh, role and responsibility and 
as a brand, you could uh, talk about yourself, what you are lo your personal values, what you are lo your designer values. Um, convince me, convince anyone, how, why should I hire you? Why, why a company should hire you? You, you need to sell yourself, uh, find your African niche. So you, we are talking here to working remotely. Uh, I'm a Spanish. I'm a, a, I will be a working like a fighting with a Spanish designers, South African designers, Nigerian designers, like a Zimbabwe designers or people from Australia. If I want to sell my work to the world, I will put a bed for you guys or for the ones that you are here in Africa or whatever is the place where you are coming from to to take your roots and your background and explore that. Be be proud of um, of where you are. If you go, I've seen someone that was posting on the chat that's from India. If try to sell that, try, try to bring your expertise and your context. That will make a, a difference and that will uh, make you stand uh, among others. In order to create a five-star portfolio, you need to iterate, iterate, iterate. It's always difficult for us designers to, to work on our own portfolio. It's very tricky because you cannot be very objective with your work. It's something that I found through, through the years with the designers and myself with my own portfolio. Share with people, repeat, iterate, and keep it simple. It doesn't need to be like super complex how you show your work. Differentiate yourself from others. So what's the thing that makes you different? If you talk to your 20 UX uh, colleagues or friends uh, or other designers, what makes you stand? What makes you differentiate yourself from them? Try to think on this, and this will help you to, to, to stand out from the crowd. Then, this is just a representation, uh, this image, but we live in a sea of sameness, I call it. We are, we are all seeing the same, um, breathing the same information. Um, how can, to my previous point, how can we differentiate? on the work you're doing. So do some research. If everyone is presenting the, the wireframes in a, in a sketch in gray, why don't you propose yours in yellow or in red? I remember a, a job interview I went like 10 years ago where I proposed my wireframes in watercolor. And I think it, things like that, I got the job. So it was a very crazy way to do, but try to, think on other ways to, to represent. You have your standard work that you might be doing with your uh, corporates, your agencies, your startups, but try to show some way how you can think uh, things different. Be brave. Don't be scared to, to be different. Try to take risks. Uh, just, you need just to follow your instinct. So this is like a muscle. You need to train every day and you need to try to take risks. If you haven't uh, taken a risk in your life, it will be scary. But if you are trying to do these things again and again, if you go to interviews, if you go to one, you will be nervous. But once you have done 20, it will be easier. So this is a muscle that you need to, to practice. This is specific for interviews and interviews I've done in the past, I'm mean, with people, bring energy, smile, try to, to be relaxed and bring energy into the conversation, feel super engaged and, and bring that uh, positive energy. So that uh, is always like a success, I would say. Some more tricks and tips uh, that could help you. Keep your portfolio, social media, LinkedIn, but especially portfolio LinkedIn relevant. Uh, sometimes when people share things, they share very old words. It doesn't matter if you are proposing words from the 2012. If it's a good project and you think it is your best project, go for it. But try to keep yourself relevant, or even if it's a small blog post or some uh, small project, try to uh, bring even side projects, try to keep it relevant and on time. We all have NDA work, so it's very tricky when I'm being asked to share work and I can't. 
so what I propose to you is try to talk about that word uh, without being explicit. So if I work with a bank, you don't need to name that bank brand, but you can say I work with a, um, a financial institution across X countries. Uh, you can talk about how your process has been without giving like a visual details. You can talk about the experience. You can reflect about how you solve a specific challenges. So there are different ways to talk about NDA work. Uh, um, I will encourage you to try to rethink how to present a project without just putting a description or an image of that project. So um, that takes also practice. Um, just take whatever you have and, and practice with that. Um, if you are looking for remote work, the world is big. So uh, you might be aware like time zone difference. Working with Australia, for instance, is a, is a killer. Uh, I've been there. Um, uh, it might affect your sleeping pattern. So try to think about the, the locations that will make your life uh, easier. There is this asynchronous uh, communication. So you need to be there engaged. When someone is sleeping, you need to be like uh, communicating and try to follow, like follow the sound uh, wall to try to keep people connected and in the communication flowing. This might be obvious, but be nice. Like, try to do your work from your heart and share that. And always reply nicely to emails, even like in rejections. Like, sometimes we feel frustrated when we are rejected, but you always reply in a nice way. Wall is very weird, you never know, and life is interconnected so try to make yourself available and try to to always uh, bring your your best uh, wishes and energy there first impressions count so uh, you i didn't do today a very good start with the uh, presentation but uh, try to 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 be on, on time try to have like a very good impression at the very beginning and try to follow up if you can a couple of more uh, tips and um, invest in yourself. So I've been working 20 years. I'm still learning. I'm still like doing uh, courses. I'm still trying to improve. And that's uh, by my experience talking to my friends and my colleagues uh, inherit or in the mindset of the designers. Try to invest in yourself. Try to upskill of the time and keep learning to 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 go with that pace we told before, like the world is in this constant flux. So don't wait at home for you, for things to come to you. You need to uh, come and put the hours and the effort to keep yourself updated. As much as you know, as much as you want to know, and as many things you do, more things and ideas will come to you. I would like to talk to you about the e-residence. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of this. So Estonia, a uh, country, in 2014 launched uh, this program where they let you, uh, not Estonian um, uh, resident, to create a digital uh, citizenship. So what that means is if you are not from there, you can have the services in that country, like open a company, opening a bank account. You are giving like a car and you can operate, create a company there to operate uh, with other countries. So they offer like uh, webinars and you can listen to them. So that's something that you could uh, be interested in looking at. And they open like in August, the digital nomad visa that uh, if you are an Estonian e-resident, let you stay in Estonia for 12 months uh, for people to travel the world working. So that's something that you might be interested in knowing. Here, um, uh, Jonathan said that this uh, will be shared. Uh, we have uh, some uh, resources that you might know, but I wanted to point. So fearless community, like uh, you have done pity that uh, Twitter for me is somehow uh, a way to read the news, the most updated news in 
in terms of design, apart from online, but uh, like in general, like websites uh, and blogs. Uh, Twitter for me is the, the place I go to, to discover. So I follow this kind uh, of uh, professionals or leaders like um, uh, Fan Snyder or like uh, Dan Petty. They offer like a lot of advice on, on how to get a job of like they offer like uh, job opportunities. So it's uh, always good to, to look at a uh, um, different uh, examples and um, you have like uh, as I say you keep on growing yourself like books books is the is the the best way to one of the best ways to learn like I recommend you like solving product design exercises uh, that helps um, is based on uh, this full day interviews where uh, the likes of Facebook or Google uh, will ask you to solve uh, some challenges. And I think it's such a good way how it's structured um, uh, how to solve problems uh, on an interview. So I recommend you this book too. And finally, two thoughts like uh, stars need to be aligned. So you need to think it didn't happen for a reason. There is this uh, famous talk about uh, from Steve Jobs in Stanford University when he talked about connecting the dots. In the present moment, we don't realize why things are happening. But if you look into retrospective, you might think, ah, if I this didn't happen, that wouldn't happen, and this would not connect it. So think that everything happens for a reason. But the message is hard work always pays. So keep on trying, keep on uh, looking for opportunities, keep, keep on sending a, a portfolios or requests or a, um, contacting people. So what I said, uh, a colleague of mine said uh, this thought about someone looking, an actress looking for a job. Uh, and the person who, the manager who was helping her to like, get the, the positions was like, get to the 100 rejections and then you analyze all the learnings and experiment. So this takes a lot of effort, but you are going to get there. You got this confidence. Always think in a positive way, yes and, and be resilient. It's like a word that uh, you might listen lately a lot, but stay positive because uh, you are going to get it. So it's a matter of time. It's a matter of keep on trying, but you are going to get it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. So the cool thing about having Alex speaking here is that she's sort of positioned this conversation from the position of someone who's been hiring and working with teams. Now we're going to have our second guest, Tom Cotterell. Now, Tom Cotterell is an absolute beast in the hiring community, and I'm going to read the introduction that I have for him. So Tom Cotterell is the co-founder of Fearless, a talent consultancy uh, who work with companies to build and scale digital design teams. Additionally, Tom is passionate about working with companies to build design teams. He's worked with 100 plus clients across the globe, including Young, London, New York City, and Bucharest. Tom, it's such a privilege to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? I've not used Teams yes, before for, to share my we screen. Can you use nice plant in the background? Perfect. OK, so um, thank you for the introduction and uh, super amped to be here. Um, so I'm coming from the perspective of uh, like recruitment, working with companies, working with design leaders like Alex to scale design globally. So recently been doing a lot of work in um, Europe and the US, but starting to access talent pools in um, Africa, Asia, which is why I had a particular interest in talking to you guys about um, how to access the international market because definitely since COVID it's been like an accelerant of remote working <coughs> and people trying to get into companies overseas um, and there's been a few sticking points but a few like things that I want to talk about is sort of how to set yourself up and start looking abroad the importance of social media in particular LinkedIn um, I'm a massive LinkedIn advocate I think I, I personally don't think you need other um, 
social media platforms to find a job and network. I think Twitter's more definitely around more like personal and uh, Instagram, uh, places like that. but LinkedIn for the job, for job hunt is, is, is perfect. What not to do as well, I think it'll be good to cover. So um, talking more about like um, what job boards to, uh, to avoid, not what to do when uh, recruiters approach you. And then the big one um, is how to charge clients. So this is a big thing at the moment um, with companies who are trying to hire people from say South Africa. Um, do they pay the same as what they would pay in San Francisco to a product designer in South Africa? Some people say they should because they're delivering the value of that client. But I ultimately don't see many companies paying San Francisco salaries to people who aren't in SF. Cool. So a few predictions and uh, learnings from my uh, time uh, on hiring and seeing how COVID is sort of accelerating these some certain issues is there's definitely more senior opportunities right now than than juniors. Um, so I don't know how many because I can't see the the screen. I can't see how many people are. Our juniors, but if you are and you do need help after this, please do do let me know, and we will talk about how to find a job, even if you, there is no jobs out there for juniors at the moment. But I'm definitely seeing a lot more senior opportunities, not not a lot of junior opportunities, and that's even more so in the US and the UK. Um, and I think a few of the reasons why is there's uh, larger talent pools, so people can find senior designers at half the price of what they would pay in say the UK or the US and get 10 times the ROI in terms of deliverables. Um, and also a lot of companies are obviously changing the way they work, they're changing their product and service to keep up with how COVID has affected their business. So what happens is there's a lot more critical projects where they have to really change what they're doing. So hiring senior designers or lead or principal designers, is a they see it as a safer bet. I've seen, I've, I've spoken to quite a few head of designs who have decided to withdraw from hiring junior folks and graduate programs, which is really sad. But I do think there are still a few good junior opportunities. And it's not that there aren't junior roles, you just got to find them and it's, it takes a lot longer and you've got to put a lot more effort into doing that. Um, and I'm not sure what the junior market's like in South Africa. So if anyone can enlighten me there, I would really, really appreciate that. Okay, to start with, so Alex made a really good point about why do you want to leave or why do you want to move overseas? And say you've made that decision to do that and you have a blank canvas, you don't know where you want to go and work, um, you don't know the companies out there. Here's a, f a few a few points where I think you should particularly target your, your focus. Um, to start with, I think you should be applying for probably upwards of five roles a day um, if you are out of work. And if you are in work, I would say between five and 10 per week. Um, and that is quality applications. That's not going on LinkedIn and just um, hitting quick apply. Um, so I'd start researching all the companies you want to work with. Um, who are the, the founders, the head of designs, who's the head of talent. So that is people who are internal recruiters who work with um, design leaders and CEOs to figure out who they need to hire and go to market to find them. So I would look on, I would definitely look on LinkedIn, find these people, I would message those people, um, sorry, connect with those people with a tailored message. If they connect back with you, there's that buy-in signal that they want to chat with you, unless they're just like LinkedIn connectors. Um, but that's a warm way of um, approaching them and figuring out if there's any opportunities in those companies um, and or just keeping them on the in your pipeline as well and that can be across many different countries um, however, wherever you want to um, apply to I think if you're looking for remote work from from say South Africa I would target the UK uh, or Europe as a whole um, maybe Asia if you if you're okay with time zones, I think the US is quite can be quite tricky with time zones, especially in like San Francisco and or Pacific time. Um, email techers. So this is like uh, essentially you want to craft a beautiful written email to a founder to a head of design that 
really gathers their interest. I think everyone gets a lot of spam on LinkedIn. I find LinkedIn is becoming like a ridiculously spammy site. I must be getting two or three messages a day sometimes of just trying to sell me like crap. So basically I would really talk, I'd really craft a beautiful message why you're, why you're chatting with them, what do you want from the conversation and maybe what can you bring them um, that they can't get from your LinkedIn profile. Um, the next point is around how to, how to stand out from the crowd. Um, I wrote a piece of content around this recently and it got gathered some interest. Um, in particular, like a mini deck should, could potentially replace uh, a CV. Um, so to start with, I think you need three, three bits of material that you can dish out to people if you're on like LinkedIn message or you're applying for a job. So portfolio is essentially what you've done, how you've done it, the kind of clients that you've worked with. So it's almost like your, it's, it's almost like your past um, under the constraints of budget, style guides or, or whatever. Um, a mini deck, so for me, a mini deck is a piece of sales material because ultimately in the job hunt, you're selling yourself um, on what you can bring to a company. So that can be like, personal projects that you've worked in the past, that can be your particular skills that you want to put into place a little bit more, where you want to upskill um, and ultimately what you can bring certain companies. I wouldn't necessarily tailor it to every company, but I would have um, different types of decks. So if you're looking for a senior product designer role in the States, um, or you could also be good for a like more of a visual designer role. I would maybe tailor it slightly depending on job titles. Everyone, everywhere is different. Um, and then a CV, like CV is really basic. Just keep it basic to the point, like go, go through, it's just to go through HR purposes. I don't think many people look at CVs. You can even download it from your LinkedIn if you keep your LinkedIn up to date. Personally, I, I don't look at CVs. Um, I look at LinkedIn profiles because LinkedIn is a better way of looking at story and a narrative of, of the person's um, uh, career. Ask for help as well. So reach out to reach out to designers in these in in these certain companies that you want to work for. Um, join online communities, online webinars like this one to um, get in front of people that you want to that you want to speak to. And uh, referrals as well is a big one. So anyone that you've worked with previously that are in companies, that always goes down well, especially in the big companies, um, to get your foot in the door. Um, I would also track everything. So I don't know if anyone has heard of Airtable, um, but I absolutely love Airtable. It's like, it's like the most stunning database. I'm pretty geeky like that. Um, or Google Sheets to record everyone that you speak to, the dates that you've spoken to that person, um, what are the next steps? Did they tell you to get back in touch in two weeks? Um, you can also dig out all the companies that you want to work for, who are all the head of like talents, head of designs, the founder, have you messaged them? So you can really track everything on one database because that gives you that visual guide of who you need to speak to, when you need to follow up. I think it's really important to not underestimate the, the importance of a follow up two or three times. Um, and then just digging into a little bit more about um, about social media, um, personally, I've always seen the importance of social media, but I think now even more, it's it's the lifeline. Now we can't meet people in person. We need that sort of online brand or profile to really get our foot in the door. So I think LinkedIn is, it's almost like a, a sticky landing page. Are you visible to these people? Can they Go to your LinkedIn profile and see who you are, what you've done, what you're about, the kind of companies that you've worked with, who you're maybe connected with, the type of content that you're creating. People want to see people who are inputting back into the community. Not everyone. People, some people just don't want to do that, which is absolutely fine. But you can, your brand is representing in a different way. Um, I think getting talking about brand. I think I just need to touch upon this. I think. The notion of personal brand can sometimes be right. I've got to get as many followers as possible. I've got to create as much content as possible. But ultimately, it's not that. I think it's just about being really good at your job, making sure that you're getting that around in a 
in, in a roundabout way to showcase your story. Um, it doesn't you don't have to have heaps of followers or create loads of content. Um, story. So LinkedIn is it should read like a story, I think, in terms of like the career experience, in my opinion. So it could be like how you started in your career, how you've moved up to say mid designer, senior designer, your way into design leadership and then where you are now, and what you're currently looking for. Um, I also think LinkedIn is um, super powerful to get in front of people. Like there's not a couple, there's not many platforms where you can cut to the chase and get straight into in front of a CEO and a message. Um, if you're looking to move overseas, I would almost, or looking to get remote work, I'd almost forget external recruiters in many cases because their remit is to find uh, like the right, the, the perfect fit at the right time without the hassle of uh, like people being based elsewhere. So companies hire them purely for that basis and then they get paid if they feel that person. They're not necessarily going to invest that time to get you in front of a company if they don't think that you're going to fill them the role so they get paid their, their commission. Um, and other things about LinkedIn as well is I feel like it's a, it's a, if you've got it, if you're visible, you can really be open to be headhunted. A lot of companies use LinkedIn just like recruiters purely to headhunt people. Um, so you can connect to, with peers like we're on here, here now, access more companies as well. Um, it's really easy to research companies, find out who the head of design is, who the, the, the chief design officer is, who's the founder, who's the head of talent, and just go after these people and make a note and go for it. And then my advice or like what, not what to do, or not don't do this. So I can't get my words out. It's been a it's been a long, a long day. Um, so don't rely on job boards. Most of them are complete garbage. I think um, the only decent, like two, I would advise are um, are LinkedIn jobs. But even then, it's become so easy to do quick apply. HR have got basically HR companies can just filter these people out so quickly. And maybe angel list for startups, and indeed in certain cases. Um, so it's really hard to stand out in these roles because they make you reply in certain ways where you can't get your creativity out. Sometimes you can't even showcase your portfolio. So I'd really be, I'd be wary of that. Um, relying on recruiters, just to go back to my point, um, I wouldn't use external recruiters in many cases, um, just purely because I, I doubt that they would invest a lot of time. Unless, they're at, unless they are retained by a company or um, they are an internal talent person where they only invest their time into one company. Um, so maybe I'd ask, I'd ask about that up front or just see if they can help, see what they say, but you might not, you might not get replies from some people. Um, don't apply for more than one role at a company. Um, so I was on a project with Zalando and there was a lot of people who would apply on the ATS system for multiple roles but ultimately it's just it duplicates your name all over the shop and it just doesn't look great so I would apply for one role um, apply for that role and then maybe reach out to like a head of design or I don't know some peers to mention that you've applied what the next steps kind of thing uh, don't spray and uh, spray and pray um, if we actually think about it there's not many roles out there that are perfect for us, not many at all. So I would, I would find companies who genuinely want to work with you and genuinely want to invest that time into hiring people like yourself. So I think that should qualify as an application, not just like a quick LinkedIn apply kind of thing. Obviously don't be unprepared, um, come with multiple materials that you can send out, maybe like a five minute video presentation on you or a longer portfolio piece or a couple of case studies ready just so you can send out different types of materials based on their interest if it's an initial conversation on linkedin send over um some like really quick material to look at and if they're interested they can then look at your portfolio which is a bit more a bit more depth and then just going on to the point that alex made about um rejections um don't get defeated with 
how many no's that you might get because it's 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 really difficult in the best of times. And I think um, in COVID and looking overseas, it can be particularly hard. So um, I would almost count how many no's you can get because you are going to get a yes for sure. Um, and I just a quick point on here about um, uh, people who are moving. If you are moving after five to ten years in one company, um, a few really quick points that I just briefly put on before this because I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. Um, talk about how you've moved around internally in companies. So if you've been at a company for 10 years, compared to someone that's been at you know, three companies in that time, you're going for the same role, certain biases might sway towards this person who's done three companies because they've been in different kinds of environments, different projects. But sometimes if you've been in one company, you've moved around a lot internally, that inner mobility. So you can talk about that. So you could almost structure it on your LinkedIn and you've been in like almost different companies or CV. Um, find a career, a career coach might be handy. There's a couple of, if you are interested in a career coach, I can recommend a few people, but ultimately they'll be the ones that can will essentially work for you, not for a company. So they can put you in touch with various different design leaders. They can help you with your story and your narrative. Um, they can help you create that visibility for your personal brands as such to get that out there into the market. Um, networking as well. So uh, if you haven't been looking for a job for 10 years, you will be shocked at how much recruitment has changed in that time. Recruitment now isn't right. Here's a CV. Here's a portfolio. I'm going to go and apply for this job. Like it's, it's changed. It's, it's all about who, you know, not what, you know, um, it's, it's about how quickly can you get in front of someone that's in the hiring position. I, I think it's very rare that a hiring manager will, will look at a hundred CVs. It just doesn't happen. It's that time. Um, multiple approaches. So apply, apply directly, apply through um, referrals, um, build recruitment relationships. You never know, there might be one or two good recruiters that really do, do take that time if they do have time, but really dig in to apply for as many roles as you can that you think are relevant for your, for your, um, for your skill set. And uh, these are the, this is the, the last point that I want to make about how to charge companies. So there's still a lot of, a lot of companies out there who are trying to find people on the cheap. Um, so now everyone is remote. They will look for places like, um, you know, um, South Africa, A or Africa, Asia, places like that, where it's a little bit cheaper than it, cheaper to find talent than it is in, than it is in the States. Um, so I'd be wary of that. But what I would say is you've also got to take into account a few things. So um, if the company can hire people from overseas, do you, will you be paying the like, US tax or will you be paying the tax where you are based? Like what are the laws there around that? And then do you, do you realistically need as much as someone would get in, in, this, in New York or, or London? Then probably no, but where I've seen the where I've seen a real nice balance is people who get paid really really well for where they're based. So for example, there's someone that I know who's based in Vietnam who is getting six figures US. Um, so he's obviously having an amazing life where he's based over there, but they're also getting someone that's slightly cheaper, but they're also paying him really well. So I think it works best for both companies for both parties. Um, but I made a point recently about we need to almost be, resp be responsible for where we are based. So if we're getting US salaries, it's just going to drive and fuel the price at where we are for the locals who aren't in this like tech bubble. Um, so I'd be, I'd be conscious of that. Like, for example, Bali um, has like the prices have like rocketed because of all these digital nomads coming in. Um, but if you are going to go after the big salaries, which I think people should do, is um, show value of everything from like KPIs, metrics, like your, what is your ROI? Why would you, why should they hire you on a big salary when they can hire someone in the States on that big salary as well? So I really focus on that, double down on metrics, numbers, um, and come back and like really defy expectations on the whole interview process. So um, talk about 
come back with them and like, this is the figure I want. I've done my research into the tax. This is how much I need to make to have a really comfortable life. This is what I would require from you, essentially. And any visas and stuff like that, do your research beforehand. It always looks always looks good. Um, and don't be afraid to haggle with companies. Like you've got to negotiate. People should be expecting candidates to push back. If ultimately if they don't push back, I almost like I almost um, get concerned with like, did people not know their worth? And so it's better to haggle and wait out for a week and get five to 10K more rather than joining and six months down the line, realizing that you're not getting paid as much and then you're unhappy and you have to go to HR and stuff like that. So um, yeah, any questions on that? I think it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite a complex topic that not many people have figured out yet. There's a lot of companies out there trying to do, trying to figure it out. So I think we'll see how that goes with, with COVID and if people do go fully remote. So. So yeah, any questions that let me know. Any tips from me also, let me know. Really happy to, to hear. And then that is it. So I will hand over Fantastic. to you. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. Stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Two seconds. Exit. Okay. Great. Cool. So I've got I've got my phone open here and I've got questions for you guys. Tom, that was excellent, very practical. Alex, as I said, fantastic. Um, okay, so we're going to dig into the into the Q and A now. Okay, so we're going to dig right into the meat of it. Uh, we have a question from Reshma Lala. She says, "Are junior, mid, and senior levels in SA equivalent to the ones abroad?" I said that's Alex's bag. I will say. It's even different company to company within the same country or the same city. Uh, you might find that the, whatever is the country you are in, some companies have different standards than others, I would say. I'm a, based on my experience of what I see through the years. Uh, in general, I would say they are aligned, but uh, I will say a small agency or a graphic design studio, very small, uh, you might be doing much, many more things because you are hands on everything and you have more experience, but maybe in other area that is a bigger company, you have more specialized and the level of knowledge will be uh, needed, will be more like uh, specific. So I don't think in general, like as a base, let's start saying yes, they are similar, but that's why it comes to research. You need to know a lot about the companies or, or the places. So you need to look at all the portfolios or agencies in each country. If you are targeting Botswana, look what is online, or if you're targeting uh, Vietnam, try to mm, see the portfolios of designers and the companies to understand what's the level. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Um, not really. I think um, I think there's a lot of South African designers who are moving out of South Africa, and like the amount of talent that comes out of SA is like just insane. So I've not obviously worked in South Africa directly, like Alex, but I would say that there's some incredible designers there for sure. Um, so yeah, I. I'd say the standards the same, but I, I feel like maybe there's more people out of South Africa who've had exposure to maybe high profile clients or companies who've got like bigger brands, but I don't necessarily say they're better designers. They just got, it's quite sad really, but we live in this world where if you've worked at Netflix, Google, Uber, Twitter in San Francisco, you're, you're, you're better than people who haven't worked in a small agency in South Africa, which is complete BS. So, um, yeah, that's my opinion. I would like to, to add something of, of this. It's like a, yeah. we dreams are not real. I come back to that sentence. It's like we all say, ah, if I would work in Google, if I work in here, I'm going to say like Google, Google is a fantastic experience. But there are 
as I said, beautiful, amazing opportunities here in South Africa, in, in mm -hmm. Africa. I am working every day with startups and teams that they are like marvelous, fascinated. So that's why my point of look around, maybe you need to do a bit more research to try to, to, to explode uh, into, into here and um, try to, yeah, but uh, it's all about uh, solving problems at the end design. I, I wouldn't go for having like idols. So uh, try to bring your own uh, shine on a star or your own uh, energy there, like where, wherever you are creating. Yeah, I agree. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, a follow up question around this thing of experience is what, in your experience, qualifies someone to be a senior designer? Because you have roles such as uh, junior, mid, and then the senior, and it can be a difficult to sort of figure out what that actually the requirement is for that. How would you define a senior UX designer? Yes, uh, I will say someone that uh, for me, like uh, going into seniority goes more into have been working into maybe that two things. You can touch many different industries and have like knowledge because the methodologies will be the same, but you have more experience based on this industry. Or if you might be like in a specific industry, your deep uh, knowledge goes. Senior, uh, when you go into senior, you go into this space of going into management. And there is this uh, conversation about how people want to stay in craft or more in management roles. So as more you move into a uh, more senior positions, you might have like more managerial, managerial uh, responsibilities. Yeah, I, I think it also is completely different on where you're like based as well. So like um, all the companies that you work with, they have different definitions of, of ranks, of like ranks or like seniority levels. Um, I always, from from what my experience of taking briefs and working with people and stuff like that is, senior is someone that can doesn't need their handheld on projects and can sort of push back more on stakeholders and, and like be more like consultative and just be that safe pair of hands. And then I find that someone that is at a principal level or about to be sort of the head or like a principal IC type route is someone that can create create projects so like think about stuff like that actually needs, needs I don't know, needs to do so yeah that's how I sort of define mid senior and principal. Also uh, you might bring a uh, strategic thinking so as move uh, as far as you move uh, you go less into tactical like short term reactive uh, solutions and you think of more uh, strategic thinking and uh, my something that I see through the years and different roles is about confidence. I mean, you can be very junior and have a, a great confidence, but being in a senior meeting with like a CEOs or a stakeholder, or super seniors, and being a confident and quiet to say this is not working and try to get to combination coll collaborations and uh, unpack or like. Uh, have like difficult conversations into more senior roles. I think uh, you might go into that. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Next question we have is from Gavin Carter, and he says, when working for a company abroad and never working face to face, in other words, fully time remote, are there any significant pain points, deal breaking challenges to this type of engagement? Um. I will I'll go ahead and answer that one. I would say um, time zones can be tricky. So for example, uh, from my experience of currently building a team which is uh, fully remote, um, and the biggest pain point we're having is time zones. So people who are based in, it's a San Francisco project, um, and they need to be based there because uh, of an intense collaboration with the end client. So that can always be tricky. So like workshops and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's usually down to time, not necessarily what you can deliver, but if it's like a live live workshop, you can't be doing it at 2 a.m. in the morning if you're fully remote. So time zones can be tricky. I'd say that's one of the major sticky points, but I, I don't know, Alex, from off the work. I will say- How would you handle that? Sorry, Tom. How would you handle that issue though as a, as a fully remote designer? I think it's different for visual designers and like I find visual designers it's easy to be fully remote but for UX I find it's 
it's it's easy to be remote, but it has you have to be in that time zone. So um, or be able to work part of the hours. So for example, if you're based in South Africa and your clients in New York, you need to I don't know, New York comes online probably like 3 p.m., 4 p.m. South African time. So if you can work to like eight or nine so you can get all the meetings in, that works sometimes. So I would be more flexible with your hours, but I wouldn't I would not do New York hours if you're based down here because it's just it will be chaos for your health um, and yeah, be messy. Cool. Sorry, Alex, I actually interrupted you. Can you carry on with what you were saying? Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Tom. That was brilliant. Uh, I would say something is about like um, keeping like uh, connected, being connected and being on top. So working remotely, you are missing that kind of uh, office uh, serendipity when you go for a coffee and you chat to someone. So you need to do that extra effort like to 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 connect and also us work um, has a lot of workshopping and doing workshops and running activities uh, with people interacting so working on the energy on the room like having a workshop for like four hours on a digital screen uh, might be something that you can do we have done like a, a FFA eight hour workshop working together the the teams but you need to keep like the pace the energy like a state of, on top of that that you might require a bit more energy that a uh, face-to-face brilliant okay we're gonna head into our last question for the evening this is from amanda grief or grief i'm sorry if i butchered that if the employer sees us as based in south africa but we're becoming digital nomads. Do we factor in travel costs, visas, medical insurance, and private retirement savings to calculate an equivalent salary in dollars or euros? Um, I would. So it's difficult. So uh, am I am I right in thinking that this person is a freelancer or perm? Uh, Let's go with that assumption. All right. Okay. If you're a freelancer, then yeah, like it's at the end of the day, it's your business. You need to charge the amount of money that you need to in order to um, live a comfortable life and look after your future. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but like, don't tell that to the client. So, like, say for example, you, the client is looking to pay three hundred three hundred dollars a day, three four hundred dollars a day. I would look at like calculating how much you need for extra tax. Um, uh, pension, all that kind of stuff, and just put that in your your rate. Um, I'd also look at VAT as well. I'm not I'm not 100% sure if you guys pay VAT, but basically there's a problem that I encountered personally when I started my business was US clients don't pay VAT, which was like so basically I was sort of like outdoing myself on a couple of grand a month because I was thinking they were going to pay VAT, but they're not. So I have to calculate that, but my rate stays the same. So it's like, it's a bit, bit rubbish, but um, yeah, factor in those costs, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I will say uh, also, if you can invest, uh, maybe work with a, an accountant or a service that could help you in that. So you focus your energy on designing, that is your expertise and, uh, and the, that kind of work. You can do it yourself. I've done it. I know friends that do themselves, but maybe you want to focus your energy on design and let a professional help you to solve that questions. If you can, I think that's a good investment to have. I agree. Okay, that's a solid point. And with that, we're going to head into the next part of the evening. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to give a bit of pre-hype for our next UX Joburg event. So Mohammed Salim is going to be our guest speaker at next month's UX Joburg meetup. Mohammed Salim is a senior product designer at Revolut, and he'll be presenting a case study about disrupting the financial services industry at Revolut. So yeah, check in for that, and uh, you can book on meetup.com. Before we head off, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Sand Dollar Design. I'd like to remind you that Sand Dollar Design is currently running a promotion in which you can book a free consultation with their team of UX strategists, researchers, and designers to review your app, website, or system, or get advice on how you can grow the UX maturity within your organization. So request a consultation on their website, sanddollardesign.co.